welcome back. Uh, I'm Dr. Ebony Zanikoy, and uh, we are still uh, continuing our series in the uh, introduction to human geography. Today we'll do session seven, and our focus is on world population, the history of population growth. So as you can see, um, there is a lot of people in the world today and um, it, governments and uh, international organizations are very interested in you know how many people do we have today in the world you know where are they uh, because these things have impact on you know how resources are distributed in the country um, and how you know the government can plan for uh, changes uh, uh, that it wants to implement. And so for a lot of governments and even international organizations, uh, how fast uh, the composition of the population and where th uh, this population is are all very important. Uh, our session today would, uh, would attempt to discuss the importance of uh, uh, population in development. Okay, how important is population uh, in the development process? I uh, would also try to de uh, describe and explain the patterns of population change. Um, another uh, objective uh, is to describe and explain the trends in the growth of the, of the world's population, and then we'll see uh, also the distribution of the world's population. In terms of outline, uh, we'll go through these uh, uh, points. We'll look at population, we'll look at the distribution of the population, uh, we'll look at issues of over and under population, the consequences of these uh, uh, issues for uh, development, and then we'll look at population growth and then summarize. I will reference, uh, refer you to uh, this book, uh, Fulberg Murphy uh, de Blige, uh, Human Geography, People, Place and Culture and I will direct you to look uh, specifically at chapter two, pages uh, 36 to 59. Uh, that will give you a lot of information on the presentation and even more. And uh, I expect that you would uh, take some time to read uh, this material. So population, uh, this refers to the total number of people in a defined territory at a particular point in time. So, uh, we can talk about Ghana's population, um, the United States, the population of the United States. Uh, it's all the number of people in this one place uh, at any particular point in time. Uh, it's not only um, population geographers or demographers. You know, people who study population issues are also known as demographers. Uh, it's not only uh, them uh, who are interested in you know, what population means. Uh, other places like statistics, uh, other disciplines like statistics, uh, would also, you know, use the same idea of population uh, just to uh, understand, you know, the complete collection of individuals. Uh, they would use uh, the term to refer to the complete data uh, that they will have to draw a sample from for analyst analytical purposes. Um, so some of the uh, major sources of, of population uh, information and, and data uh, comes from uh, census reports. Uh, for us in Ghana, we have had um, uh, reports. We have had one in uh, 1980. There was another one in uh, 1992, another one in 2010. Uh, usually census reports, are, uh, censuses are carried out every 10 years, uh, but depending on resources uh, uh, available to, to the country, uh, sometimes it may be longer, sometimes it may be shorter, but that's uh, one source of uh, population information. Another source will be birth and death records, uh, and then also records on uh, migration. Um, so uh, these are some of the places, if you want to find more information about a country's population, these are the places to visit uh, or pieces of material that would help you with the information. All right, so any geographical study of population will usually be focused on uh, attempting to examine the number, okay, how many people 
are in this uh, particular place. Uh, the composition, uh, how many males versus females, how many older people versus uh, young people are in the population. Uh, they will look at trends. Is the population growing, declining? Okay, they'll look at distribution. Where are these people? Uh, are they mostly in urban areas or in rural areas? Um, and all these things will be looked at against the background of the conditions, okay, that surround these, uh, this population. Uh, where are they getting their food? Okay, uh, industrial productivity, uh, pollution issues, the higher the population, the higher the chance that, um, you know, uh, issues of pollution, a lot of cars will be on the street, uh, people will use a lot of uh, goods and services and those would uh, result in uh, um, you know waste and uh, you know there will be questions of the health of the population uh, sometimes in high density uh, populations you can find very poor people and their health will be in question and then you know depending on the nature of the population you can also be thinking about questions of you know natural resources available because everybody uh, every nation depends on its resources forest resources um, uh, agricultural resources land availability uh, even the ocean uh, for feeding and taking care of the needs of the population So population data, uh, data such as composition and structure are important for uh, development. You know, every government, I think in this country we have the uh, National uh, uh, Planning and Development Commission or National Commission on Planning and Development, okay? Uh, they are uh, in charge of, you know, examining the size, the growth, the trends, the direction of the growth, and everything, and then you know, using this information for planning purposes. Uh, sometimes you want to wonder whether we have such a commission in the country at all, uh, because you know a lot of uh, uh, peri-urban areas are growing out of proportion. Uh, they don't have supplies of roads or water supply or electricity and all these things. Uh, these are some of the functions that uh, a, a commission like that is supposed to play. Look at the growth of the population, which direction it is going, and then knowing all this information, be able to appropriately uh, plan for it. Um, also, in terms of the, the connection between population and development, um, you want to know the locations uh, of, of the population growth uh, so that you can plan and put in um, social amenities. You know, where should we put more schools or hospitals uh, are all uh, issues that are uh, related to the size of the population. And so in places like the United States, uh, it, census reports are very important to them because depending on the size of the population, uh, it, it may be declared that your, your community is not big enough to have a representation in, in Congress or something like that. Uh, and so they take these things seriously because it, it also determines the amount of resources that the government will allocate to your particular community. Uh, we also, uh, uh, population uh, geographers would also look at population density uh, because it has influence on, you know, environmental degradation. Uh, we have seen the amount of waste uh, in the city of Accra and all the health uh, problems that it's generating for, for the city. Uh, also, uh, living standards uh, are implied here. The more people there are in one place, the more the competition for resources, jobs, uh, housing, um, you know, for space generally. And so uh, these are all uh, have implications for development and, and, and very important for geographers and uh, demographers to study. So, you know, question is how do we uh, measure um, population, uh, particularly population density? Okay. 
um, uh, one of the most uh, easy ways to measure density is to look at the number of people in a country uh, and just divide it by the amount of area that is available to these people. And so uh, you would take the population size divided by the land amount of land uh, and then uh, that would give you your, your answer. So for example, in Ghana, uh, we are currently about uh, 25.2 million. Um, that's the size of the population. And then we know the land area to be about 238,535 square kilometers. And so we can easily you know, find the crude uh, uh, density of the population for the whole country. But obviously, uh, this will vary across the country because some areas of this country is more populated than other areas. Uh, but even more important, the more important uh, index to find or to calculate is, you know, the physiographic density, which is, you know, how much arable land is available to the population. Because if the population has to be fed, then you are asking the question, how much uh, agricultural land is available for cropping to feed this population. And so, uh, according to one source, uh, in Ghana we have about 20.7 to 21.1 uh, square kilometers of arable land. And so we can take the 25.2 million population size and divide it by 21% of 238.4 uh, 1,535, and we can find an answer to how much land per, uh, per head uh, is available for uh, uh, individuals in terms of the food production. Okay, so that said, uh, having described uh, some characteristics of the population, let's look at the distribution, population distribution. Now globally, um, about 75% of the population lives on just 5% of the land area. Uh, this should not surprise you too much because we know that about 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And so we have just about 30% of land area. And of this, we also have areas that are covered by deserts, we have areas that are covered by highlands, we have uh, areas that are marginal zones or forest regions where nobody can really live, like the Amazon. Uh, and so we have the bulk of the population just concentrated on a very small area. Uh, of this uh, small area and the population, East Asia and Southeast Asia uh, have most of the population. And that is followed by Europe and uh, North Af America. So uh, the population of Africa is believed to be one of the most increasing or the, one of the large populations. And uh, you know, a lot of world organizations are concerned about you know, the uh, growing, the rate of growth of the population. But if you look at concentrations of population, it's actually in Asia and North America. Um, the, the countries of East, uh, of East Asia, uh, Japan, China, Taiwan, and the Koreas, uh, account for 25% of the overall uh, population uh, in the world. Um, and that is followed by, by Europe. And um, you know, if, if you go to North America, uh, most of the population is concentrated on the East Coast, New York, New Jersey, uh, along that line, and also mostly on the west coast, California, uh, that, that place. So in terms of the um, percentages uh, of the distribution, uh, Asia would take 60.7%. Uh, this data is a bit, uh, a bit old, so uh, by now, uh, this could be a little higher. Uh, that of uh, Europe, could be uh, declining a little bit because of all the population issues that are going on there in terms of you know, people 
not interested in giving birth anymore. Um, Africa's population, 13.2, uh, is also set to grow uh, higher. Um, and then the Americas have 13.6, and Oceania uh, will have just 5%. Now, a number of factors uh, determine, you know, the, the distribution of the population. And I would classify these into physical factors and human factors. Uh, the physical factors would include uh, things like the terrain. Um, uh, people are concentrated mostly in low-lying areas uh, because these are the places where you have a lot of water resources for, for growing food. Uh, usually the, the soils are much more fertile uh, than you know, mountainous regions uh, where uh, food growth and even the general conditions, sometimes it can be too cold. Uh, and so people would usually not be attracted to these places. Um, you can also talk about climate. Uh, dry areas would also lack water. You know, every time the population uh, grows in a particular place, it's because it can be fed. And so usually when resources for agriculture are lacking, uh, that would be a reason for people not to be found in those places. Uh, our, uh, cold regions like the Arctic, uh, Antarctic, are also too cold to grow food and raise animals. And so very little population will be found around this place. And then we have uh, soil conditions. You know, much more fertile soils would attract more uh, of the population uh, than marginal soils. And you know, what you realize from the literature is that if you look at the history of human uh, civilization, uh, much of it has concentrated around you know, uh, flood plains and low-lying areas around rivers. Um, and it's just because people have to be fed. Uh, and then everything I've talked about has been related to water availability and accessibility. Um, people need water for everyday chores, uh, cooking, uh, taking shower, uh, and also for agricultural activities. And so that would also be very important for uh, where the population will be found. Uh, vegetation uh, would also, to a large extent, determine uh, in places like the Amazon where it is uh, sometimes impenetrable uh, or harbor certain kinds of viruses and fungus, uh, that can uh, impact negatively on human health have also been places where you can't find a lot of the population. Um, what you need to remember though is that uh, although these factors determine to a large extent where the population can be found, um, in recent times with globalization, with the development of technology, you don't have to really live by a farmhouse to get your food. Uh, and so uh, these things are beginning to help in the uh, dispersal of population. Uh, uh, to a large extent, people can live almost anywhere and still get their food and water supply and everything, uh, even though it might be a little more expensive uh, in terms of the transportation to bring in food and other accessories. Uh, the, there is also the human element, uh, historical factors. I believe that most of you uh, uh, still live where your dad uh, lives. And probably your dad would also find himself living closer to where his, his dad uh, lived. Uh, just because these earlier folks might have identified the most optimal conditions for living and would have settled there. And to be close to all these other resources, you tend to live closer to your family. Uh, there is also the sociological uh, 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 factor. You know, people would all usually want to uh, interact with other human beings, except for some of you students who sometimes do wish that you know, your, your hall, your room in the hall was just assigned to you because everybody else is uh, annoying to you. Uh, but the natural tendency is for people not to isolate themselves but to uh, live with other people. And then there is the psychological issue. Um, people don't want to uh, be alone, uh, they, usually you feel afraid 
what might happen to you if you fell suddenly sick in the night, you know. So uh, people want to live to, uh, close by other people. And then there's a cultural thing, you know. Uh, sometimes people will say, I don't want to go anywhere else. Uh, there are some people that can live in one place and not venture to any other place uh, just because they feel comfortable, you know, in the place where they have found themselves. And then there is the geographical factor. Um, usually landscapes, uh, you know, breathtaking landscapes, uh, uh, the ocean, the beachfront, are usually some of the places people want to live because of the beautiful scenery. Um, and uh, these things affect, to a large extent, uh, the distribution of the population. So uh, we can talk about low population uh, areas and high population areas, you know, just, um, you know, group a set of factors that will be more pertinent to each of these different uh, uh, types of population. Uh, but dry areas, um, as we have already explained, because of lack of water for growing crops, um, would usually not support high densities. And examples would be uh, areas around the uh, Sahara, um, the Arabia uh, Desert, Kalahari, Namibia Desert. Uh, these are places where we don't find a large population. Uh, wetlands, you know, uh, when uh, there's too much water, uh, that can affect, you know, whether or not a population would like to live in, a, in that place. Uh, because sometimes it can uh, produce higher temperatures or crops might be destroyed because of the excess water, except in, in uh, East Asia where wetlands are used for uh, agricultural, uh, the growth of rice. And so that could be an exception. And then we have cold territories where you know, the, the North and South Poles, people don't want to live there. It's too cold, can't grow crops. And then highlands, okay. It's difficult to construct housing on highlands. It's difficult to raise crops and animals um, and you know, interact with surrounding areas. You have to constantly go up and down the hill, which can be a uh, deterrent to large populations. In terms of high population, uh, low fertile lands, industrial towns, you know, industrial towns who usually attract a lot of um, uh, workers to work in the industries. Uh, capital cities, Accra, we know has a higher population than, uh, let's say, Brahaba Bumi, you know, which is uh, uh, a, a, a no-name town. And then also areas uh, with rich agricultural soils. Uh, we know, for example, that you know, a lot of northerners migrate to the Middle Belt, to the cocoa areas, uh, to come and um, you know, engage in agriculture, ag agriculture from time to time. And so these will add to the populations of these areas. Now let's look at uh, the issues of over and under population. Uh, what are these? And what are the consequences for, for, for these? Um, so uh, when we talk about overpopulation, what we mean is that there are more people than the physical and human resources can adequately support. Okay, for a good uh, standard of living. So um, mo um, people are, th the resources are not enough and there are too many people. Uh, some of the causes of these, uh, of, of this situation, is a situation of high birth rate and declining death rate. And so it creates a big natural increase, which is the difference between the death rate and the birth rate. Um, and it is caused also sometimes by uh, immigration, and more and more people moving in into uh, this one place. So, uh, for instance, we can actually explain the high population in Accra uh, uh, th this way. There, people are still giving birth in this place, but then we have a lot of migration from all over the country uh, to Accra, and that is what is explaining, you know, the population growth. Uh, to the extent of whether G Accra is uh, overpopulated, uh, that is yet to be determined. But I mean, there are signs towards that uh, in the sense that you know, if the waste is not removed fast enough, if there are urban poor people, 
Uh, it means that the resources in Accra is not enough to support the population, so we, we might include Accra in, under this category. Um, there are some advantages, though. Um, you know, you can have cheap labor force. You know, a, that a lot of the reason why initially uh, uh, a lot of companies in the United States headed to China to put up manufacturing uh, plants over there is just because of the size of their population uh, and the fact that they can get very cheap labor. There is also the issue of potential markets. Uh, these people would have to eat, they will have to live in their house, they will have to send their children to school, uh, they will have to you know, buy clothes for their children, and so they become a potential market. Um, potential <laughs> because if the population is poor, then uh, you don't get that potential. But if the population is adequately resourced, then the chance is that uh, they can become a very big market for the supply of goods and services. Uh, there are some problems associated with overpopulation. Uh, these are some of them. Poor housing. You know, we see a lot of people in these uh, zongos, uh, Nima, Mamobi, Jamestown, uh, Medina Zongo, uh, you know, living in, in what we might consider sharks. You know? uh, and then there is unemployment. The larger the population, the more the competition, fierce competition for available jobs. And uh, depending on whether the economy is growing, or declining or stalling, uh, that can become a big uh, problem in terms of competition for uh, employment. And then there is food shortage. Uh, more people chasing after very little food. Uh, usually in overpopulated uh, uh, areas, uh, they don't grow their own food. They have to depend on outskirts uh, for food. And sometimes if there, is a, there are a lot more people uh, you might even have your money, but the food might not be available, or food might be too expensive. Uh, there is also pressure on public ut uh, facilities. Uh, we need more electricity, we need more uh, water supply, we need more uh, schools. Uh, all these things, uh, hospitals, uh, come under a lot of uh, pressure. There is congestion, overcrowding, uh, and then, as I already mentioned, development of sw uh, slums which are uh, places where people live uh, marginal lives. The, po the sanitation issue, we all know about that. Uh, cholera uh, seems to have gone down. Uh, recent news seems to show that it's coming back. A lot more people getting sick from uncollected waste. And then uh, social vices. Uh, if people can't find jobs, if people are living on the margins, then they take to robbery and other kinds of things for uh, survival. How do we prevent or you know, try to control overpopulation? Uh, one of the big issues that a lot of uh, uh, international organizations have been pushing and a lot of governments have been accepting is birth control. Because like we said earlier on, the difference between the birth rate and death rate produces that uh, growth in the population. So if you can limit the, uh, the number of births uh, through the use of contraception, uh, then you can limit the uh, rate of growth of the population. Out-migration uh, is uh, also one of the ways government can encourage or uh, control over population. If government uh, can transfer its uh, public workers to uh, you know, outside of this over overpopulated area, then it can, in some ways, reduce the, the pressure in, in that place. Uh, increasing food uh, would be one of the ways to take care of an overpopulated uh, uh, place. And then putting up more housing projects and creating more job avenues. Uh, these are uh, usually a bit difficult to do and takes a lot more time um, because you know, individuals add to the population, families. So usually, a lot of policymakers will highlight the first two uh, because they are much more easy to achieve uh, than the, the last three. Um, but we still, here in Africa, we are still facing a situation of you know, low uh, use of contraception, and that is why our population is much higher. 
underpopulation is the reverse, uh, a situation where you have more resources than the people available to use their resources. And, you know, it usually uh, uh, comes from, you know, physical characteristics uh, such as the climate. You know, in a place where you have uh, uh, desert conditions um, or in a place where you have a difficult terrain, uh, people would not want to, to live in that place. You have uh, another issue of strict immigration policies. You know, that currently, the United States is practicing some of the, uh, and also Europe, is practicing some of the very strict immigration policies to ensure that you know, not too many people flood into uh, uh, their country. But the, the flip side is that if, if uh, families are not uh, producing more children, then in these uh, well-developed uh, places, the tendency is that they'll have a lot more resources than the people available to use their resources. Um, uh, the problem with underpopulation has to do with the fact that you have a smaller market size, and so it wouldn't support industry, uh, because if an industry uh, uh, develops and cannot find the people to sell goods and services to, then it will die out. Um, small size of the labor force, people can't, uh, um, you know, industries can't find people to work. Uh, and so uh, that would be a problem for economic growth uh, in these places. And so uh, there is uh, the advantage that a lot more people will have very little resource, and so there was a tendency that the, the standard of living might be high, but it can also impact other areas. So let's look at, you know, we have talked about, you know, characteristics of the population and the changes and the distribution. Um, what we see is that population uh, has changed over, you know, if you look globally, it has changed over uh, three major periods. Uh, the first is uh, during the agricultural revolution around uh, 8,000 BC. Before then, uh, the population was just about um, five a million to 800 million. Um, but uh, since then, the population has grown uh, from this time onwards, it grew by about 5% uh, uh, globally, annually. And the other time that we had uh, the world experienced a major growth in the population uh, it was around 19, uh, 1750 AD uh, when the Industrial Revolution uh, took place. Uh, this was a time where uh, goods and services were produced en masse. Uh, people could find more jobs in industries. Uh, living standards uh, improved and increased. Um, and so it, it encouraged more uh, growth in the population. And then the third phase, or the third time in history, where you, you can see a significant change in the size of the population was 1950 where improvements in uh, medical science uh, helped to remove or reduce the effect of uh, things like the childhood killer diseases, measles, uh, diphtheria, um, uh, things like that, that killed a lot of children and therefore encouraged more people to, you know, even though they are reducing the size of their families because of uh, medical advances, uh, population decline doesn't take place uh, right away. Um, and we will see a lot more of this uh, in the, a few slides down. So uh, usually it's some, of the, some of the characteristics of the population that uh, population geographers and demographers will talk about is the sex ratio. How many males are there to every 100 females? Uh, and uh, that will tell you to a large extent what the fertility uh, uh, rate is going to be like. Uh, and then the other thing that uh, we can talk about in terms of characteristics is the age structure. Uh, usually three major age uh, cohorts have been defined, uh, including those below 15 years, uh, 
uh, those between 15 and 64, and then those above uh, 64. The middle group uh, are those uh, that we will consider as economically active. Uh, these are those that are working. Um, and then the first, the first and the last group would uh, usually be considered dependent. They don't do any work, and they depend on the work from the middle of, uh, 15 to 64 year uh, group. Now, depending on the sizes of these, uh, it can determine to a large extent uh, whether the economy is going to grow or not, whether uh, there will be a lot more people feeding on just a few people or not. A typical uh, a way to examine these things uh, is to use the population pyramid. Okay? And, and this is usually a graphical illustration of the distribution of age and sex in the population. Uh, if you look to the right, uh, what you see here is that usually with this uh, uh, graphical representation, uh, females are put on the right and males are put to the left. And then you have the vertical representing the age structure. And so how many uh, females are here uh, at a particular age uh, versus uh, males uh, to a large extent uh, determine uh, what is happening in the population. And you can uh, categorize this according to the, the cohorts, the three cohorts. And so you can determine the size of the dependent population and the size of the working uh, population. Now, the, the pyramid uh, usually would have a broad base uh, that is showing that the population is mostly youth, youthful. Uh, that, that means that that population has a lot more children and therefore a greater potential uh, for the population to increase. Uh, and then uh, you can contrast that with uh, a situation where this is much narrower uh, and the top is bigger, uh, which is showing that uh, the, the dependent population, the younger age uh, population is smaller than uh, those that are in the middle and the, and the uh, aged uh, group. And usually that signals that you know, the population would either be growing slower or not at all, or stall. Um, and we find usually the broad-based structure in developing countries, uh, they will have a lot more um, dependent population. And then the other, other explanation of, a, of the top being uh, bigger and the bottom being smaller would usually characterize uh, developed uh, countries. So, you know, depending on where countries are in terms of their socioeconomic development, um, you can see these different structures uh, of the population. Uh, the first one uh, is representing a high growth, a rapid growth. Uh, and it's usually found in developing countries. This represents uh, Uganda's situation. And then you would have uh, European ones and more developed countries, you know, having a, a structure that is sometimes uh, poorly defined. It's very difficult to define it. But you have a smaller uh, dependent child population, and uh, the middle is usually bulky. Okay, so we have been talking about dependency. Uh, there is a way to you know, calculate these things. Um, now, a dependency ratio uh, usually is a measure of the number of uh, dependents supported by you know, 100 people in the actively, uh, economically active group. And so uh, we can calculate uh, to see, uh, for example, for Ghana, uh, what our dependency ratio would be. Uh, usually in developing countries, you have about one uh, active, uh, economically active person for each child or each dependent. And so 
uh, uh, that contrasts with uh, the developed countries where you have two adults working to take care of just one uh, dependent. And so the uh, living standard will be much higher uh, in this situation than uh, in a lot of developing countries. The youthful structure in uh, developing countries means uh, there is a high dependency and uh, you know, with high dependency comes a lot of pressure on government resources. You know, and you know, a lot of governments have to know these things to know where to you know, prioritize. If, if your population has a lot more youthful uh, dependent group, then you are looking at more investment in educational resources, uh, in uh, childhood well, wellness uh, uh, resources uh, uh, versus, you know, uh, the developed countries where you have, you know, a lot more active and aged population. Uh, in that case, the, the needs are a bit different uh, from a developing country situation. Okay. So we would uh, uh, move on now to look at population growth. Um, this is an interesting uh, topic. Uh, we, there are a number of factors, uh, in fact, as we have already talked about, and this might uh, be a very, uh, very straightforward uh, slide to uh, go through, because we've already mentioned that birth rate, death rate, and immigration or emigration are the factors that contribute to the growth of the population. Uh, if you take the difference between death rate and birth rate, you get the natural uh, population growth. And um, uh, there are some measures that we need to understand. Uh, something like the crude birth uh, rate. Uh, it's the number of live births per year uh, for every thousand uh, people that are alive in the society. And so uh, the higher this number, the higher the, uh, the growth of the population because more people are being added uh, to the population. And that tells you the fertility rate in that country. Now, every fertility rate is also determined uh, by the age and sex structure as we have already uh, you know, uh, discussed. Uh, and there is also the question of what people believe about family size. Uh, we know that if we compare the current generation to our mother's generation or our grandparents' generation, their emphasis on family size is different from our emphasis on, on family size today. Uh, the fertility rate can also be determined by uh, population policies of the country. Uh, we know about China's one-child policy uh, which is affecting the size of the population. Uh, we can also talk about uh, policies on contraception and fertility. Uh, those will all affect the, the, the fertility rate. Now, we also need to talk under population growth, uh, total fertility rate. Okay. Uh, this is the average number of children that a woman uh, will have uh, throughout her childbearing years. And it's usually uh, pegged as an uh, age between 15 years and 49 uh, years. Now, not many people, not many women will have all these uh, children because a number of factors will come in to influence things like education, uh, things like uh, women's rights issues, uh, you know, improvement in the economy, if women are able to work and all that, uh, they will all, you know, um, factor into the total fertility rate. Now, there is also another uh, rate that we need to mention here, which is the mortality rate. Uh, mortality will refer to the number of deaths in the population, and we can calculate the crude rate as the number of people uh, that die uh, per a thousand of the, of, the living, of the people living in the society. Uh, under the mortality rate, we can talk about child mortality rate, uh, and so that's the number of children that are dying um, per 1,000 uh, 
uh, live births. And then we can also talk about the maternal mortality. Uh, that is number of women that are dying from uh, per 1,000 women that give birth um, every year. Now there is a cycle uh, that you know, relates the rapidity of the growth of the population to poverty. Now, if you have a high dependency, which means that uh, there are more youthful uh, population uh, than those who are working to take care of this population, uh, then that means that our parents have to spend more on the children that they are taking care of. If they are spending more, that means that they can't save. Now, if they can't save, then banks cannot give loans to businesses uh, to increase productivity. And that will have a knock-on effect on economic growth in the country as a whole. Uh, that feeds into living standards because that means that parents can't find jobs you know, to earn income to take care of uh, their children. And the children that will be produced in this way might lack education, might lack skills that would, you know, help them to take care of their children. And so uh, this, uh, this becomes the reason, you know, this link becomes the reason why a lot of governments are concerned about rapid growth and high dependency. Um, some sources show that, you know, this relationship is not that uh, strong and that uh, depending on the particular situation of a country, uh, you can break off the cycle at different points. And so it need not be uh, a doomsday prophecy in terms of a self-fulfilling uh, defeatist uh, system. All right, so... Uh, so far, we have talked about some characteristics of low and uh, uh, de uh, developed and developing countries. Uh, this chart just, you know, makes it very easy to remember these things. Uh, for developed countries, usually population uh, density will be high. There will be a lot more people concentrated in one place. And in development, developing countries, is the opposite. Um, and then uh, birth rates in developed countries are usually low uh, versus uh, developing countries. And um, the death rate is also higher in developing countries than developed. And so this is just a simple way to remember some of these uh, uh, contrasts between the, the two economic zones. Now, reasons for low birth rates in uh, developed countries would include things like late marriage. You know, people are usually going to school. Uh, they, they don't have time to start their family early. Um, you have things like higher standard of living, uh, which means that it's difficult to take care of children. And you can't combine children, you know, the rearing of children with other things like economic uh, power of women. You know, if women has, have to go to work then, and they can't usually afford a babysitter, then that means that they advise themselves against having a lot more children. Uh, there's also the uh, Western culture, uh, which does not encourage many children. People want to live in nuclear day, uh, uh, the man, the wife, and, and children. They don't want any extended family systems. Um, and there's usually no pressure you know, on people who decide not to marry. Uh, what do we see in our society? Immediately the wedding is done, you know, there's pressure on the woman to, uh, to have a, a grandchild. You know, this uh, does not usually occur in uh, the Western societies and these are gradually sipping in here. And so hopefully these will moderate our population growth. Um, also, couples are usually interested in having material possessions. They want to build their house. They want to own a car. They want to own a business. And so these things don't uh, go you know, side by side with having a lot of children. And people uh, uh, in developed countries usually uh, practice contraception, uh, which also limits uh, child growth 
the, the growth of uh, the population. What do we, do we see uh, in terms of uh, high birth rates in developing countries? What factors will motivate this? We have the cultural attitude, you know, encouragement of, uh, of uh, women to have a lot more children uh, to extend, you know, uh, the family. Um, we also have the, the lack of interest uh, in the use of contraception. And, and that uh, for, for uh, Ghana in particular, uh, it is believed that only 17% of married women uh, practice contraception. Um, and then there is also the low status of uh, women. Uh, usually uh, women are not as educated. Uh, they don't participate in the work, uh, labor force, a formal labor force. And so that affects their economic status and, and, and impact on their, their status at home. There is also early marriages. Uh, recently I saw a documentary on uh, a, no, a news item on a Fulani girl who was just 15 years old and was uh, being prepared for marriage. Um, a lot of these things happen in, uh, in many ethnic uh, groups uh, in this country and in a lot of developing uh, countries. Um, also, the, the idea that children are a security, a social security, you know, because we don't have a good social security system um, a lot of uh, families will give birth to a lot of children with the hope that the children will come and take care after them in their old age. Uh, and the, the larger your children, yeah, the size of your children, the more you can extract from them. Uh, that is granted that you are able to take good care of them and they become successful people. Um, and then there is also the question of large families seen as a, a sign of prosperity. You know? The bigger your, your family size, the more area you can occupy and possess things. So uh, th those are some of the, uh, of the things that you have to keep in mind. All right, so these questions, I believe, um, you know, seek to help you to remember some of the things that we have said. Uh, how would you define a population we know what a population, uh, we've defined population already, um, a way to calculate uh, population density. Um, what is the, the term, the geographic term for a country with a high population density? Um, and then the birth rate and uh, measures that can be put in place to reduce fertility uh, in, in a community. So to summarize, um, we have covered what population is, uh, the distribution, and the fact that it's uneven across space. Uh, we have talked about over and under population and the consequences of these. And then we have talked about the different reasons that account for the variation of birth rate uh, in uh, developed and developing countries. I hope uh, you have enjoyed this uh, session and Go back and watch the video many times and ask your questions in class. Thank you.